I want to take a moment to remind you all of my SEAL playthrough. Specifically, because a good real-time finish, or at least a decent real-time finish, isn't always the best measure for how painful a playthrough is. Just keep that in mind. Today, following up yesterday's video with Pidgeotto, we are going to beat Pokemon Yellow with another middle stage evolution. It's time for Gloom to have its day in the sun. Except not really because Sunny Day wasn't invented until Generation 2, so there's not going to be any use of that move or Solar Beam, at least I don't think. Now, this Pokemon is the last species in its evolutionary line that is getting a playthrough on my channel. At the beginning of this year, I did a playthrough with Oddish, who earned a time of 1 hour 21 minutes and 46 seconds, with 4 resets at level 71. It had a game time of 5 hours and 12 minutes. This placed it in the E tier, just behind Hitmon. On Chan, honestly, not a very strong performance for the first stage grass poison type. However, then more recently, I did Victory Bell vs. Vileplume, and I was incredibly surprised at how well its final stage fared. It clocked in with an amazing time of 41 minutes and 36 seconds, with one reset at level 59, with a game time of 2 hours and 44 minutes. This is to date the fourth fastest species in my Pokemon Yellow tier list. It has only been outperformed by the likes of Nidoking, Gengar, and of course, the number one Pokemon in the tier list, Victory Bell. So I'm really curious to see how Gloom stacks up against its first stage as well as its final stage. Will it be right in the middle of these two times, around the hour mark? Or will it significantly outperform, placing it closer to its final stage, or underperform, placing it closer to its first stage? Well, let's find out. First of all, let's go through some base stats. Gloom has 60 HP, 65 attack, 70 defense, 85 special, and 40 speed, giving it a 7.81% chance to crit in generation 1. Throughout its evolutionary line, its stats grow fairly linearly. For example, Oddish's attack is 50, Gloom's attack is 65, and Vileplume's attack is 80. However, unfortunately for Gloom, this same trend does not apply to its special stat. Oddish's special is 75, Gloom's grows to 85, and then Vileplume's gets a nice little spike up to 100, growing an extra 5 points over the previous evolutionary growth. And speaking of growth, it's nowhere to be seen on Gloom's learn set. The entire Oddish evolutionary line doesn't get access to this move, while the Victory Bell line does if it starts as either a Bellsprout or a Weepin Bell. Gloom's move pool is Absorb, Poison Powder, and Stun Spore to start, and then Sleep Powder at level 19, Acid at level 28, Petal Dance at level 38, and Solar Beam at level 52. Of course, Vileplume started with Petal Dance and Acid, but Gloom isn't going to get that luxury today. Now, like all grass types in Generation 1, this thing has an incredibly short list of TMs that it can learn. It does get access to Swords Dance, which all other grass types get, except Execute and Executor. It also gets access to Takedown, Double Edge, Mega Drain, Solar Beam, Mimic, Reflect, Bide, and Rest. And also Cut but I, uh, I don't think I'm going to need Cut. If I ever end up using Cut in a Generation 1 solo challenge, I think you all should just, like, comment a lot and, like, check if I'm okay. Alright, so now I need to explain why Vileplume was such an amazing Pokémon in Generation 1. Well, first of all, its typing means that it's not going to struggle against Brock because it has 4 times damage in the form of its grass moves. But beyond being able to clear this early game hurdle very quickly, it also has a medium-slow growth rate, which is shared amongst all of the Pokemon currently in my S tier. What I have discovered is that this is actually the best growth rate for solo challenges. It levels up faster than every other growth rate in the game until level 30, and this gives Pokemon an incredible advantage because they're off to a quick start. And uh, here is where I give the biggest however that I have ever given in a video. However, Gloom is not going to get this quick start. And that is largely because of its starting three moves. Stun Spore and Poison Powder aren't very useful to knock Pokemon out quickly, and Absorb is quite frankly trash. It has base 20 power, so with the same type of attack bonus, it has 30 effective power. Now while it does heal me in battle, which is nice, it's not very useful against the plentiful flying type Pokemon that I usually grind against in the early game. Also, there are tons of bugs in Viridian Forest, and you can see that here against the first bug catcher. Like, look at the damage that Absorb is dealing to his Caterpie. So, this early game is going to be 
pretty bad. I could probably rush immediately and face Brock and just win right away, but I've found in the past that usually that's a little bit short-sighted and then Route 3 becomes quite difficult and slow. Luckily for Gloom, it does have access to Poison Powder, and this is speeding up my knockouts, especially against the next trainer who has two Metapods. Also, this status condition is critical here because I run out of Absorb, so I have to backtrack to the Viridian City Pokemon Center to heal up before I can continue defeating trainers in Viridian Forest. I finish off the yellow exclusive bug catcher, catch myself a Pidgey, which I can use for fly later on in the playthrough, and then I defeat the mandatory bug catcher, finally earning myself access to Pewter City. Okay, so I'm going to fight the Light Years Junior Trainer in Brock's gym. He is fast experience for me because I have Absorb, and this is going to allow me to two-hit both of his Pokemon. With him out of the way, I am now level 13, and with that, I am ready to face Brock. All right, let's go into this battle and one-shot both of his Pokemon because that is how it's going to go. And I'm sure here you're thinking that this is absolutely overkill. Well, uh, just wait, just wait. Uh, I'm doing this all for a reason. Finally, Onyx's bind wears off. It uses bide instead. I hit absorb, getting a critical hit, and I finish the Onyx off. So that's a Brock split of seven minutes and 22 seconds, which is quite bad for a grass type. The prize for winning this battle is the TM for Bide, which in my most recent videos, I usually just teach to my Pokemon right away. If I have my accuracy lowered, this can be an alternate way to do damage to the opponent and bypass the accuracy check. It's time for Route 3, and up first is a Bug Catcher. He has a Caterpie, a Weedle, and another Caterpie. So I'm going to use Poison Powder in combination with Absorb to knock out the first Caterpie, and it really doesn't take that long. However, his following Pokemon, which is a Weedle, is a completely different story. This thing has a double resistance to Absorb, and it can't be poisoned with Poison Powder, so I am going to have to use Bide to knock it out. It hits with Poison Sting, my first Bide does about a quarter. My second one takes it to half, keeps using Poison Sting, so I take it down to red health, and then I can finish it off with a single Absorb. After that, all he's got left is a Caterpie, so I'm going to knock this thing out slowly with Absorb again. Alright, so this playthrough is quite tedious. <laughs> I hope you are realizing that. Up next is Youngster Ben, of course. He has a Rattata and an Ekans. The Rattata is easy to knock out with two uses of Absorb. The Ekans is a Poison type, so it also has a resistance to Absorb. However, here there is another complicated factor which is I can't really use bide. The reason is is that if it used wrap only the first turn from wrap would be accumulated into the bide counter and as a result I would waste a lot of turns doing very little damage back to it. So I'm going to knock it out with absorb. I figured out early on in the battle that I really should be using stun spore to cut its speed and its consistency. I do that and then I slowly finish it off. However coming out of the battle with youngster Ben I want you to look at my PP. I have four absorbs left and seven bides left, so I think it is time to heal up. After all, the two mandatory trainers that are next have either bug type Pokemon or poison type Pokemon on their teams. I head back onto Route 3 and here I think that facing the Lass is essentially the only choice. She has two Pokemon, whereas the other mandatory trainer you could fight has four bug types and two of them have a double resistance to absorb. In this case, the Lass only has a Nidoran male, and it's not that hard to knock out. Also, Bide is a viable option here, but I just decided to spam Absorb against it and finish it off. I have to quickly backtrack to Pewter City to reset the Lass's position, and with her out of the way, now there is only one more mandatory trainer on this route. He's a bug catcher, he has a Caterpie and a Metapod. I can't believe I'm talking about all of these fights, by the way. Yeah, they take forever, and I can't believe that I am around 10 minutes and 30 seconds arriving at the Pokemon Center outside side of Mount Moon, and that is off of a 7 minute and 22 second Brock split. This might be one of the slowest Route 3s I have ever had. Alright, so now let's head into Mount Moon. Here, like in Viridian Forest, I am going to continue to defeat optional trainers. The first one that I fight is the Super Nerd by the Rare Candy. He has a Magnemite and a Voltorb, and he actually gives decent experience yields, so I'd like to defeat him when I think that I need experience. And at this point, you're probably wondering why I'm getting all this experience. Like, Gloom has decent stats, it is a Grass type, so it's super effective against both Brock and Misty. Why waste all this time in the early game fighting trainers that don't have particularly good experience yields when considered in the context of the entire game. 
Well, I head down this ladder because I want to grab the ether that is behind this rocket. Let's just save to make this a little bit more safe. After all, his first Pokemon is a Zubat. Here's the thing. As a flying poison type, it has a double resistance to absorb. So that move only has seven effective power, which is absolutely awful. Since it's a poison type, I can't poison it. And that leaves only Bide to knock it out with. However, there are significant complications to this. Number one. It has supersonic, and if I hit myself in confusion, it will cancel my bide and I will unleash no energy. Number two, it has leech life, which in generation one is doubly super effective against grass poison types. Yes, in generation one, the bug type is super effective against the poison type, and the poison type is super effective against the bug type. It's kind of a strange interaction that has been changed in modern games. The thing about Leech Life is that it also subtracts the damage that Zubat heals from the Bide counter, meaning that every time I pay back damage, I am not actually dealing that much to it. Right away I realize that I'm not going to be able to spam Bide and knock the Zubat out, so I go for Stun Spore to paralyze it, but using Absorb is doing so little, and eventually the Zubat finishes me off. This is not how you want to be losing in the early early game of a solo challenge, by the way. All right, so it does not look like I'm going to be picking up that ether. Let's instead just go over here and fight the hiker. After all, he is trivial. After that fight, I am going to use an escape rope to leave the cave because I need to heal. How am I going to defeat the super nerd and Jesse and James's poison Pokemon with only absorb if I have like eight uses of it left over? So playing Oddish earlier in the year made me aware of this problem. That is the problem that grass type has as an offensive type in the early game game. For both Victory Bell and Vileplume, this wasn't an issue because they had access to Acid right away. However, Gloom is sort of in the worst case scenario, and that's because Oddish learns Acid earlier on at level 24. With Gloom, I have to wait till level 28 to get it. And that is really annoying. Just watch how slowly this battle against the Super Nerd is going. Even the Voltorb takes three hits to knock out. Ah, here I level up to level 19 where I can learn Sleep Powder. I'm going to teach it in the place of Stun Spore. After all, Poison Powder is still useful against Flying and Bug types. All that's left for me to defeat here is the Coughing. It only knows attacking moves, Tackle and Smog. So if I use Bide, I can deal massive damage back to it on each turn and finish it off quickly. However, even doing this, it's a pretty close fight. I only survive with 11 hit points. Luckily, I did my standard strategy, which is purchasing potions in Viridian City, so I can heal Gloom up and proceed to the fight against Jesse and James. All right, so going into this fight, the clock is at 14 minutes and 15 seconds. I just want to note that because I'm not sure everyone is aware just how long battles take when you're playing the game at four times speed. In these videos, I have to slow the battles down dramatically so that my narration lines up with all the footage. Footage. Just so you know, we cut every battle so that all of the moves and all of the damage lines up with what I'm saying precisely. Sometimes, when I have a long battle though, I speed the footage up, and this does skew the perception of how long these events are taking to play out, so I don't blame you for not getting an intuitive sense of it. However, in this case, I really do want to draw attention to just how long this battle is. I have to defeat three Pokemon, and it takes roughly 45 seconds to do this. If we make a crude approximation. If I was playing on one time speed, this battle would have taken me three minutes. Alright, so the choice in Cerulean City is pretty obvious. Of course I'm going to take on Misty first. I take a quick victory over the pecking Goldeen trainer, and now I am ready to earn myself the second badge. Up first is Staryu. I go for Absorb. It takes it out over three hits, and then Misty sends in Starmie. If this thing had a single Psychic type move, it would be so strong against me, but today it doesn't, so all it's going to use is either Tackle, Harden, or Misty will use an X Defend. Buffing her defense does absolutely nothing against Gloom because Absorb is a special type move, so I take an easy victory as was expected. Alright, so as I heal up after this battle and head over to the rival on Nugget Bridge, let's just quickly check in with Gloom's level. It is currently level 22, so I still have 6 levels to go before I'm going to get access to Acid. Alright, now going into this rival fight, right away you'll notice that the Spearow has 33 speed, which is 2 more than Gloom, so it moves first, lowering my attack stat, which is not consequential, and then I put it to sleep with Sleep Powder. I'm going to have to knock this thing out with Absorb, so it's once again going to take a while. So the early game for Gloom is just incredibly slow. The Spearow wakes up, I put it back to sleep, and then finish it off with two 
more absorbs, then Sandshrew comes out, and I figured that at level 22 I'd one-shot this thing with absorb, but no, 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 this move is not very good. And of course, it uses sand attack, lowering my accuracy. I miss an absorb, Sandshrew hits with scratch, getting a critical hit, and then I knock it out. Okay, but even with my accuracy lowered one stage, the final two Pokemon won't be that difficult to knock out. I take the Rattata down with two hits, and now all that's left is the Eevee. I get a crit here, speeding my progress up just a little bit, which is quite nice considering how slow things have been. And it would be awesome if everything was going to speed up now, but that's not the case. Let's be real. I have so little PP left over after the rival battle that I have to backtrack to the Pokemon Center, doing this nice little loop-de-loop. -loop. Then, immediately on Nugget Bridge, there is a trainer who has two bug-type Pokemon. One of them is a Weedle, which again has a double resistance to Absorb. I am going to use Bide to knock it out. This way I save Absorb for battles later on on Nugget Bridge. Normally, I want to get through this area without having to backtrack to the Pokemon Pokemon Center even once. But I think coming out of this first battle, you can tell that that is not going to be a reality for Gloom. After all, the second trainer is a lass, and she has a Pidgey and Nidoran female, both Pokemon, which resist Absorb. Also, the first Pidgey has Sand Attack, so it can lower my accuracy, and that probably is going to make Bide the better move for the rest of the fight. However, on the Nidoran, I had started to reevaluate my strategy and decided to put it to sleep and then use Absorb to knock it out. I'm actually doing a decent amount of damage, largely because I am quite overleveled at this point. I finish her off, now I have to backtrack once again to heal up, and that's very important because the next battle is against a youngster. This is a guy that I uh, very rarely mention. Normally we just completely skip over this area of the game because there is nothing to worry about, but today I have to talk about him. He has an Ekans, but he also has a Zubat, and we've already talked about why this thing is so tricky for Gloom to deal with. However, things are not the same as they were the last time I faced a Zubat, because now I know Sleep Powder. By using this move, I can put it to sleep, and then slowly chip away at it with Absorb, not having to face its Leech Life and Supersonic. Still, while this does give me a win, I do have to go back to the Pokemon Center again. And of course, you're thinking it should speed up from here. No, of course it doesn't. The next trainer has a Pidgey and a Nidoran female again. She's basically a higher level clone of the earlier lass. However, after her, I do get to take on one more trainer because he has just a Mankey and it's not going to be good against Gloom. But once I defeat him, I'm going to backtrack to the Pokemon Center again, heal up, head back to the route, and here I have to defeat another Ekans and a Zubat. Once again, Sleep Powder gives me the win. And now the knockouts are going to speed up but the playthrough is not. That is because after I pick up the Charmander, I'm gonna start fighting some optional trainers. Whenever I have to make that choice here, I know that the Pokemon is going to perform poorly, so I am really not liking Gloom's potential for a final tier list placement. After defeating the typical hiker who has a Machop and a Geodude and obtaining the Elixir, I then fight the other hiker who you can choose to face instead of the first one that I defeated. He's easy experience for me because he only has an Onix, and after that, I go up against this guy who has a Slowpoke. Normally, I try to avoid this fight, but today since I have Absorb, this battle is quick. And once again, things are going to slow down because the next trainer has a Nidoran male and a Nidoran female. She's mandatory though, so I have to finish her off. And after the battle, my PP is quite low, so you know the deal. We're going to head back to Nurse Joy, heal up, and then continue with the route. And we are going to do this by fighting more optional trainers. First, this hiker. He has a large team three Geodudes and one Machop. This provides a lot of experience. After that, I am going to fight this youngster who has a Rattata and an Ekans. Takes a little bit of time, but even the Pokemon that resist me are starting to become fast to knock out. After all this training, Gloom is still only level 26. I have not yet gained access to Acid. And now I want all of you to pay attention because all of this training has been building towards this moment. I have to face the Oddish Lass. She became notorious in my first Almanite playthrough when I couldn't get by her for like 45 minutes, Absorb did so much damage, and I only had water moves to deal damage to her. But in this case, the scenario is actually kind of worse for Gloom. Her Absorbs can't do more than one damage to me because I have a double resistance to Grass-type moves. Since Oddish is the same type 
type is Gloom, she also doubly resists my absorbs, so that isn't really an option. I can't use Poison Powder because Oddish is a Poison type. And then if I use Bide, it's not going to do very much damage because every time she uses Absorb, she is gaining back health. So uh, yeah, there isn't really a good option here. In the end, what this fight comes down to is, uh, yeah, it's PP stalling. And the AI in Generation 1 does not have PP. They can just use their moves infinitely. I do manage to take out the first Oddish. Against the Pidgey, I realize that I can poison it and then spam Sleep Powder or Poison Powder to deplete my PP and hopefully get to struggle. However, because it's poisoned, it is moving every turn. This allows it to lower my accuracy, which does affect struggle. And this also allows it to deal chip damage to me, taking Gloom down to 17 hit points before her second Oddish comes out. As a result, there is just going to be no way for me to win this fight in my current situation. Okay, so let me summarize what all of this means. All of the training that I have done to this point in the game, over 25 minutes of real time played on four times game speed, all of that hasn't been enough to defeat a lass with two Oddish and one Pidgey. I made a reference to my Seal playthrough at the beginning of this video, and in that playthrough, I was extremely frustrated, mostly because Seal couldn't find a consistent way to get by the champion. However, this feels like the inverted Seal, because here, the early game is like the most tedious exercise. You have to pay attention because Gloom's moves interact very differently with all of the enemy Pokemon. You can't just mindlessly spam A with Absorb. It's not like rap. Okay, so let's continue training. I'm going to fight this guy over here. I call him the Mew Junior Trainer because he can be used to trigger the Mew glitch. There are also still a few other trainers left to battle before Bill's house. This guy has a Rattata and a Spiro. After that, I have to battle backtrack through Cerulean City and start training on wild Pokemon. Very frustrating that I skipped the swimmer in Misty's gym. That would have been a lot of fast experience. And of course, I'm going to have to do a second playthrough with Gloom, so I'll fight him then. For now, I am stuck knocking out level 9, 10, and 11 Pokemon here, which don't provide that much experience. However, this is better than Johto, so I should count my blessings. Training here is nothing like training in Azalea Town when you can't get by the rival. By the way, check out my Corsola stream if you want to see me doing that. From the moment that I start this training, it takes me a grand total of three real-time minutes to finally level Gloom up to level 28, where at long last, it can learn Acid. I think it makes sense to replace Poison Powder, and now, without further ado, Let's fight the Oddish Lass. I go for Acid, and it gets the one hit. I think that is the most satisfying one hit that I have ever had in a playthrough. Next is Pidgey, I go for Acid again, and another satisfying one hit. Can we make it three for three? Of course we can, we are massively overleveled, and I finish her off. As I head to Bill's house, I should just mention that I had to defeat her. I couldn't just go to Vermilion City. The only way that the cop moves out of the way of this house's door is after you talk to Bill. So I was stuck there on that last. There was no alternative for Gloom other than defeating her. Against the rocket outside of Cerulean City, despite the fact that I am really overleveled, I do not one-hit the drowsy with acid. It uses hypnosis, putting me to sleep, and then proceeds to use pound, disable, and then confusion, which is actually doing a lot of damage. The second one gets a critical hit, taking me to orange health. I continue to sleep. It uses confusion again, taking Gloom down to nine hit points. Then Drowsy uses Disable. Okay, that's good. Gloom wakes up. Perfect timing. I hit Acid and finish the battle. That was way too close. All right, so I hope that I am off to the races now. Sandy is next, and I'm going to see if I get the one hit here with Acid. And in this case, I do. So her team is no problem for Gloom. And now I do think that things are going to accelerate from here. On the SSN, I pick up the TM for rest. Then I have to face the Gentleman. He has Fire-type Pokemon, but with Acid, I can defeat them fairly quickly. After that, it's time for the Rival. He is trivial. I one-hit the Spearow with Acid, one-hit the Rattata with Acid, one-hit the Sandshrew with Absorb, and then two-hit the Eevee with Acid. And with him cleared, it is now time to take on Surge.
Grass resists electric, so this fight shouldn't be that bad. However, Surge does have two normal type moves. Also, Raichu is faster, and Growl can lower my physical attack, which would ruin the damage of Acid. Luckily, he just misses a Mega Kick. I use Sleep Powder, putting the Raichu to sleep, and then I hit with Acid. It does almost half. My second Acid takes Raichu down to KO range. It continues to sleep, and with that, I have earned myself the third badge. And with it comes a 12.5% boost to my defense stat, despite what Surge tells you by the way, he is lying about that, it does not boost your speed. If you didn't already know this, in the cartridge, the stats are arranged in this order. HP, Attack, Defense, Speed, and Special. So Special is always last. I think what happened here is they wanted Surge's badge to boost your speed, because after all electric types are very fast, so it makes sense to get this boost here, and then it makes sense to get a defensive boost at Koga, because originally his Pokemon are poison types, which are all quite defensive and rely on stall strategies. However, what I expect happened is the uh, the badges just boost the stats in the order that they appear inside of the internal RAM. So first attack, then defense, then speed, and finally special. For me, it's kind of peculiar because I am a lifelong Bulbapedia user, and speed is always listed last there, which is why I also list it last on my overlay. But to this day, speed is actually listed after defense in the location where the Pokemon's data is stored. Anyways, I hope that small factoid about the internal workings of the game is interesting to you. Okay, so I've used Dig to head back to Cerulean City, and I've also picked up the bike by now. And that means the Wrapping Lass is next. Now, while Acid is neutrally effective against her Pokemon, it doesn't one-shot the first Oddish, and luckily this thing just uses Absorb. Then I want to hit the following Bellsprout and make it to her second Oddish. Oddish. Just so that this thing doesn't roll for a move, it has a 1 in 3 chance of using Stun Spore. I'm going to put it to sleep with Sleep Powder. The 75% chance of success is just better here. After that, I use Acid to knock it out in 2 hits, and with that, her final Bell Sprout is no issue, and I'm off towards Rock Tunnel. And I'm sure it will come as a relief to all of you, it certainly did for me. Gloom has no problems in this area of the game. I make it to the self-destructing hiker, where I can use Absorb to one-shot all three of his Pokémon. And with that, I've arrived in the mid-game. Normally with first stage Pokemon, I explore the rocket hideout to pick up extra items as well as an additional rare candy, but today Gloom is performing bad enough that I think I should complete this area. After that I head to the department store where I purchase 5 Carbos. I think this is the best option because Gloom does not have very much speed. After picking up the HM for Fly, I decide to head back to Celadon City rather than going to Pokemon Tower, because I think defeating Erika now is going to be the best option. After all, I can use Acid in the gym to defeat the trainers here, gaining more experience, and then after defeating all of them, I take on Erika. Okay, so up first is Tangela. I'm gonna knock this thing out with acid, and oh, I did less than half. I really thought I was gonna do more than half. Tangela hits with Constrict. Luckily, my speed isn't lowered. My next acid takes it to red health. Tangela goes for Bind, getting a critical hit. By the way, while this move is triggering, Erica uses a Super Potion. Yes, that is how the AI works. Then Bind continues. I'm finally released from it, and I finish the Tangela off with two more acids. Up next is Weepin' Bell. Because of Erica's good AI, this Weepin' Bell is only going to be using acid against me, and I didn't want to get my defense lowered and then be hit by Gloom's acid as well, so I put the Weepin' Bell to sleep and knock it out with two of my own acids. Gloom is last, I try to put it to sleep, it fails, acid hits me. Then I decided that Erica wouldn't be able to do enough damage fast enough to knock me out, so I just start using acid, and three turns later, I finish her off. Now the reason I prioritized doing this fight before going to Pokemon Tower is because now Erica gives me the TM for Mega Drain, which I am going to teach to Gloom right away. At long last we have both a better damage dealing move and a better recovery move than Absorb. I'm going to teach it in the place of Bide of course because this move isn't useful outside of the early game. Also, I'm going to use two PP-ups that I got on it. After all, Mega Drain doesn't have very many uses. 
The rival in Pokemon Tower is next. This fight is normally easy, and yes, today it is once again easy. Thankfully, Gloom has no struggles here, and I take a simple victory. However, I have to explore the rest of Pokemon Tower now, and two floors higher is Agatha Jr., who has two Ghastly, and once again, Gloom's typing of grass and poison is just so bad offensively. The ghosts in this game have a double resistance to acid, yes, ghost type resists poison type, and they have a single resistance to my grass type moves. So I'm not able to do very much to them, and that could be problematic because these ghosts love to paralyze with Lick, confuse with Confuse Ray, and use Nightshade to deal consistent damage. Honestly, reflecting on this fight while doing the voiceover, I think that I should be going for Mega Drain here. It would probably do more damage than Acid is dealing. Either way, Luck is on my side, and I'm able to defeat her on my first attempt. At the top of the tower, I go up against Jesse and James. Now you'll note for this fight that Gloom has finally learned Petal Dance. I don't go for it against the Meowth so that I'm not locked into it for the later portions of the fight. I finish it off with two Mega Drains, and then against Arbok I put it to sleep and start using Petal Dance for maximum damage. It goes down to two hits, Weezing is next. Unfortunately here the self-inflicted confusion is quite bad, but finally Gloom stops hitting itself, puts the Weezing to sleep, uh, well it hits itself one more time. Then it finally snaps out of confusion and finishes it off with two more uses of Petal Dance. Next on Cycling Road, I grab one more PP up. This allows me to max out the uses of Mega Drain. After that, I explore the Safari Zone, and then I head back to Saffron City to take on Sylph. After fighting the Machoke guy to grab the rare candy, and then the Arbok guy to grab the card key, I decided that I needed to heal before taking on the rival, so I defeat this one trainer that blocks the healing room, and with that, Gloom is level 39, which is close enough to level 40, and that is typically the level that I like to face the rival at for the first time. So to prevent some backtracking, let's see how this fight goes right now. Up first on his team is Sandslash. I assumed that Mega Drain would just one hit, but like, no, this move is not that good. Gloom is also not that good. I do just over half. Luckily, because the rival has good AI, this Sandslash is stuck using Poison Sting, so I can just take it out with one more Mega Drain and heal all the damage it did to me. Next is Cloister. I go for Mega Drain once again, dealing just more than half. And this time, the rival's Retaliatory Strike does much more. It takes me down to just above half health, which is not very nice. I recover a little bit, level up to level 40. He sends in Magneton next, and I think I should put this thing to sleep so that it can't use Supersonic against me. Honestly, I have to say, this Magneton is really annoying. Look at its special stat. It has 99 special. Also, its 81 defense is respectable, so knocking it out quickly is something that I can't do. Luckily, I do finish it off without any major issues, and next is Kadabra. Okay, so it's going to hit pretty hard. It uses Psybeam, doing more than half. My Sleep Powder connects, putting it to sleep, and then Acid finishes it off over two more turns. All that's left is Flareon. I outspeed by two speed. I'm able to put it to sleep and then finish it off by using Acid four times. So, Gloom beat the rival on its first attempt. Not a bad performance for it. I think if we just covered up the time, this run would actually look pretty good to this point. Only two resets. And now you might be thinking that I forgot something very important. And yes, I haven't taught Gloom's Swords Dance yet, and it's available here in Sylph. So I backtrack to the 7th floor where I can pick up this TM, and I'm going to teach it in the place of Pedal Dance. So the first fight that I do with this new and powerful move is the fight against Jesse and James. Here I put the Weezing to sleep so that I can set up in peace. Unfortunately it just keeps waking up, it's really annoying. Eventually I get fully set up, and now I have to explain the downside of using Swords Dance with Gloom. Basically my best physical move is Acid. I could potentially use Takedown, Double Edge, Rage, or Cut, but hopefully you see why all of those moves aren't better options. Also in Generation 1, Acid has a 33% chance to lower the opponent's defense, so like that's decent. Still, this fight against Jesse and James felt way closer than it should have. I do manage to take the win though. Up next is Giovanni, and I'm going to show this fight because Gloom has been performing terribly so far. Once again, we're faced by the problem where the majority of the opponent's team resists my damage. Luckily now I have Swords Dance to partially counteract this. However, when I get crits, which is what happens on the first turn that I attack, I bypass all my beneficial stat changes and do much less damage. By the way, if you didn't know this already, in Generation 1, when you get a critical hit, it doesn't do a flat 2x modifier to the damage. The 
modifier is actually based on your current level, so the higher you level up, the better the modifier for the crit is. Strangely enough, this formula maxes out at 1.95, so multiplying my attack stat by 4 is obviously much better than getting a crit. Luckily Gloom's base speed is low, so its crit rate isn't very high, and that means I am usually getting more powerful assets. Against Nidoqueen, I wasn't sure what to do, like maybe Mega Drain, it does a decent amount, then I use Acid, it does even less, so I guess a neutral Mega Drain is the correct option here. And with that, I finished Giovanni off. Okay, so now let's head into Koga's gym, and here I have to explain a type interaction that always trips me up. Poison type moves deal neutral damage to psychic type Pokemon. Because I grew up playing Generation 1, I always assumed that psychic type Pokemon were just completely dominant over poison types, and for the most part, they are, but poison types can hit them for neutral damage, which I guess is nice. In this case, it gives me an easy win over the mandatory trainers in Fuchsia Gym, so now let's take on Koga. The strategy for this fight should be self-explanatory. Sleep Powder, set up with Sword Stance, sweep with Acid. I want to take the time while I do that instead to talk about the risks for this fight. First of all, all of Koga's psychic moves are going to do a lot of damage to Gloom because they're super effective. Second, the Venomoth is faster, and Leech Life does 4 times damage, plus it heals the Moth. However, I have a couple advantages. Number one, Koga sees that I am a Grass-type Pokemon, so he will occasionally use Toxic on me. Also, his AI has a chance to use an X attack every turn, and while this will boost Leech Life's damage, for all the Venonats, it's just going to be a wasted turn. Okay, so now I'm fully set up, and I've swept through the first two weaker Venonats, but will the third one survive? And in this case, the answer is... no. Venomoth is last, it goes for Psychic first turn, doing massive damage. It takes me under half health. Also, it gets the one-third chance to lower my special. In this case though, that badge boosts my attack stat, and that gives Acid more damage. However, not enough for me to knock it out. On the next turn, Venomoth hits Leech Life, and Gloom survives. Alright, Acid connects, and with that, I have defeated Koga on my first attempt. Although, I definitely got lucky right at the end. With his badge, I now get a 12.5% boost to my speed stat. And that takes Glooms up to 78, which is not very good. And unfortunately, Sabrina and Blaine are up next, both whom have super effective damage against Gloom. In this case, I tend to like to face Blaine first, because Sabrina is really so gambly. You have to go up against her Abra, which knows Flash and is going to lower your accuracy. However, against Blaine, you have the chance of using Sleep Powder, not getting hit by a Fire-type move, because he doesn't have good AI in Pokemon Yellow, and then I can set up with Sword Stance, boosting my attack stat, and also badge boosting my speed. Unfortunately for me, the Ninetales immediately goes for Flamethrower, it does massive damage, Gloom surprisingly survives, but it does get burned. I put the Ninetales to sleep, but burn damage finishes me off. Okay Blaine, do not use Flamethrower. Unfortunately, he uses Confuse Ray, I hit myself, Ninetales uses Quick Attack, but I snap out of Confusion and put it to sleep. And then I looked at my experience bar so I'm going to level up really soon. That means I can't set up Sword Stance against the Ninetales, so I'm going to need to knock it out with Acid now, and then set up against the Rapidash. Luckily for me, the Ninetales snoozes long enough, and I take it out, leveling up to level 44, and then Rapidash uses Stomp, and I put it to sleep. Alright, it's good it didn't flinch me there. Unfortunately though, with three turns of setup, my speed is not boosted high enough to go first against either the Rapidash or the Arcanine. As a result, I guess I'm just going to have to chance it on the first turn with a sleep powder. Arcanine goes for a reflect, and I put it to sleep. Okay, so how much is acid gonna do? Well, it looks like a quarter. Maybe it's gonna be a five hit in the worst case scenario. Luckily, I lower the Arcanine's defense on the next turn, and I take it to red health, so this is going to be a four hit. Blaine's ace continues to sleep, and I finish it off, earning myself the Volcano Badge and a 12.5% boost to my special stat. And that's just in time, because after I do some property damage digging out of the Cinnabar Gym, I head straight to the Saffron Gym to take on Sabrina. Up first is Abra, and I know from the Blaine fight that I'm gonna max out with a 111 speed once I fully set up with my badge boosts. As a result, both Kadabra and Alakazam are going to go first against Gloom no matter what I do, so I'll just set up on the Abra, finish it off, and then hopefully make it through her final two Pokemon. The Kadabra uses Psywave. Normally, this does pathetic amounts of damage, but today it does half. 
I finished Kadabra off with Acid, and all that's left is Alakazam. Okay, please don't use Psychic. Nice, Sabrina heard me, she uses an X Defend. I hit with Acid, and Alakazam doesn't faint. So we have to roll the dice one more time. This time, Alakazam goes for Reflect, and then I finish it off. You might think that this fight would be harder if she had good AI, but that isn't the case, because Reflect is a psychic move, so the Alakazam could have done the exact same thing if her AI was changed. The only move that she couldn't have used against me would be Recover. So I guess it would be marginally harder statistically for Gloom, but overall, Sabrina is rarely a challenge in Generation 1 anyways. And now after all of this, it's been quite the journey so far, we have arrived at Giovanni's Gym. I take my time in here defeating some extra trainers just to level up to level 47, and after doing that, I think I am ready to use my first rare candies of the run. I use 8, taking Gloom up to level 55. Now, let's see how Giovanni is. First up is the Speedy Doug Trio. It could KO me with Fissure, but Giovanni just goes for Guard Spec and I put it to sleep. Now I'm going to set up with Swords Dance, and with that complete, I use Mega Drain to one-shot his lead. Next is Persian, I go for Acid, also getting a one-hit, and now I need to explain both the Nido Queen and the Nido King, and how their movesets interact with good AI and the Grass Poison typing. Because of the priority list that the AI checks, these Pokemon are stuck using only Tail Whip or Leer, so they actually don't have a chance of knocking Gloom out at all. Honestly, I forgot about them when I was doing this. Actually, no, 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 I just like sleep. I just put them to sleep because putting Pokemon to sleep is so satisfying in Generation 1. With them out of the way, all that's left is Ride On. I hit it with Mega Drain, and it goes down to a single hit, of course. So the gym challenge is over, and while Gloom only has three resets, its time is over an hour and five minutes. Okay, so it's time for the rival battle on Route 22. Because I used rare candies, I'm now quite overleveled, and after I badge boost myself, I have more than enough speed to move first against all of his Pokemon. Mega Drain one-shots the Sand Slash, Acid one-shots the Execute, Mega Drain one-shots the Cloister. I have to two-hit the Magneton because I got a critical hit, but luckily, due to my typing, it can't use Thunder Wave, which is probably its scariest move. I outspeed the Kadabra, Acid one hits, and all that's left is Flareon. I hit with Acid, and it goes down. Up first is Lorelei, and I have to mention my move set because I changed one move. I taught Mimic in the place of Acid. Now I did mention how that was basically the best physical move, but I can use Mimic to take physical moves and then set up with Swords Dance and hit for more damage than Acid would ever be able to deal. Plus, Acid is not particularly good offensively throughout the league. Additionally, in the case of Lorelei, I just want to use Mega Drain the entire time anyways. I put the Dugong to sleep and finish it off with two hits, then Cloister is next, I go for Mega Drain here, and I get a one hit. That's pretty good. Okay, now it's time for the Slowbro. I click a little bit too fast, hit it once with Mega Drain, but then I put it to sleep, and from here I'm going to use my typical strategy. Mimic Amnesia, set this up, maximizing the damage of Mega Drain, and now I should be able to make it through the rest of the fight. I knock Slowbro out, move on to Jinx. It's probably going to survive my Mega Drain. It does. Goes for Ice Punch. Hopefully no freeze here. There isn't one, and I finish it off. So all that's left is Lapras. I go for Mega Drain, and it does enough damage. So Lorelei is defeated. Okay, uh, this guy, we had some problems with him in my Kangaskhan video, but uh, this is Gloom, so we should be fine here. Just so that I don't get frozen by the Hitmonchan, I put it to sleep and knock it out with two uses of Mega Drain. Hitmonlee is faster than Gloom by four speed. It hits high jump kick, getting a critical hit, doing almost half. However, I'm attacking with Mega Drain, so by the time I finish it off, I've only lost a little bit of health. Plus, there's an Onyx that immediately follows it, and I obviously one-hit this thing, refilling my health to full. Alright, time for Machamp. It goes for Karate Chop. This move has a high crit ratio, so it does like a third to me. However, if I keep healing and it uses moves like Leer, I am going to win this. It does eventually hit one more Karate Chop, but it's nowhere near enough, and with that, I've taken my second victory. 
All right, so now let's head into Agatha's chamber. And here we are gonna use a strategy that was suggested to me on my Victory Bell vs. Vileplume video. A lot of people mentioned that I could set up with Swords Dance and then mimic Lick for maximum damage. After all, in Generation 1, all Ghost-type moves deal physical damage. Unfortunately for me in this fight, Agatha switches out right away, so I have to defeat the Golbat with Mega Drain, which is taking quite a while. Eventually, she sends Gengar back in, so I'm able to put it to sleep, and then successfully mimic Lick. Okay, so let's see how this move does against the Ghost type. Well, on the first hit, it gets a crit, doing about a third, but then my next Lick knocks it out, so that's perfect. Next, she sends in Golbat. I knock it out with one Lick. Now it's time for Haunter. Oh no, never mind. It's time for Arbok instead. I hit this thing with Lick, and it does like maybe a third. Luckily, it paralyzes it. I take it down to lower health. Agatha uses a super potion, and then eventually I polish it off. Okay, time for Haunter. The only problem is it moves faster than me, confusing Gloom. And now that I've set up with Swords Dance, I'm going to deal more damage to myself because the confusion calculation uses your attack stat and your defense stat. The self-inflicted damage does half, but luckily on the next turn I put it to sleep. And then I realized that I'm running out of Lick PP, so I started to use Mega Drain to knock the Haunter out and this is taking a while. It wakes up, uses Hypnosis, and puts me to sleep. Okay, please wait wake up, and in this case, I do on the second turn sleeping, which allows me to hit another sleep powder, putting the Haunter back to sleep. I once again attempt to knock it out with Mega Drain, but Agatha is in the switching mood, so she sends in Gengar, and I do very little damage with Mega Drain. Okay, let's put it to sleep. Oh, well, never mind. Gengar is going to use Confuse Ray first. Gloom hits itself all the way down to orange health. Gengar goes for Psychic, and that's it. Okay, so hopefully you can see how unstable this fight is. It's mostly just because Gloom can't move first against any of Agatha's Pokemon. And the reason that's happening is because I'm leveling up early on into the fight. What I really should have done here is used one rare candy so that I wasn't leveling up mid-battle. But honestly, I was a bit scared of Lance and the Champion, and I wanted to squeeze out an extra level if I could. In the end, I get very lucky here because in the next battle, I'm able to knock her ace Gengar out and move on to her final Pokemon, which in this case is Arbok. Now I'm paralyzed, so it moves first hitting Acid, and Gloom survives on 7 hit points. Sleep Powder works, putting the snake to sleep, and then I use Lick, taking it down to orange health. Okay, so now I'm going to have to knock it out with Mega Drain. Because it resists Grass-type moves, this is going to take two hits. Luckily for me, the Arbok continues to sleep, and I finish the fight off. Alright, so it's time for Lance, and this fight is going to be a little bit annoying, because I have to knock the Gyarados out with Mega Drain. Sometimes I get asked in the comments, why don't you use a grass move against Gyarados? It's a water type. Yeah, it's also a flying type, so it takes very little damage from this move. I constantly have to put it back to sleep and slowly whittle it down. After it faints, Gloom gains enough experience to level up to level 60 over a damage rounding threshold, and I want all the damage I can get against the first Dragonair because it resists grass type moves. The Gyarados took neutral damage from them. Luckily, Dragonair is much weaker than Gyarados, so it's taking around the same amount of damage, and that's very good because I'm doing enough damage to knock it out uh, unless Lance uses a Hyper Potion and now I have 3 PP left over on Mega Drain, so I guess I'm not going to knock the Dragonair out and be able to steal Ice Beam. Alright, what are my choices for moves to Mimic? I can steal either Slam, Thunderbolt, or Hyper Beam. Like, I could steal Thunder Wave, but then I would just lose. In this case, because I've set up with Swords Dance, I think it makes most sense to steal Hyper Beam and just hope that I'm gonna knock the Aerodactyl out. I finish the first Dragonair off. Okay, time for the second Dragonair. Hyper Beam hits, knocking it out in one hit as well, and now it is time for the Aerodactyl. Because it's fast, it hits me first with Wing Attack, and then I have chosen Sleep Powder, and that's specifically because if I don't one hit with Hyper Beam, I want to be able to recharge for free. In this case, Hyper Beam hits, and with the Sword Stance set up, it is enough to knock it out. All that's left is Dragonite, and this thing has less of a chance of surviving Hyper Beam, and so with that, I have defeated the Elite Four. Okay, so here I have three rare candies in my bag, and I actually decided not to use them because I felt like Gloom was doing pretty well and I wanted to see if it could beat the champion at level 60. So, let's go into that battle.
Up first is Sand Slash, and this thing is only going to spam Poison Sting against me. I do put it to sleep, and I think this is mostly a mistake. I mimic Earthquake, and then I set up Sword Stance once, but then I realize how close I am to leveling up, so I should probably knock this thing out. However, then last minute before I take it out, I'm like, maybe I want to outspeed the Alakazam and set up Sword Stance two more times. And here's the cruel irony of all this, because maximum badge boosts only take my speed up to 154, which is two less than Alakazam's 156. So it moves first to anyways, hitting Psybeam, doing almost half to me, and then I hit with Earthquake, finishing it off in a single hit. From there, I level up losing my badge boosts, but I still have my outrageous attack stat. I try to put Executor to sleep, but I miss, and it hits Hypnosis. It goes to town with Barrage, and then Stomp, taking me to orange health before I finally put it to sleep. Okay, because I set up, I'm going to use Earthquake here to knock it out over two turns only, even though it was resisted. I'm kind of surprised by that. Next is Magneton. Obviously, Earthquake gets the one hit, and now it's time for me to heal on the Cloister. I go for Mega Drain. It does more than half, healing me to around half, and then Cloister chooses Aurora Beam, taking Gloom down to 15 hit points. So if it had chosen Ice Beam, I would have lost. But it didn't, so I get one more Mega Drain in and finish it off. All that's left is Flareon, I go for Earthquake, and with that, Gloom has defeated the champion. It clocks in with a time of 1 hour 16 minutes and 17 seconds, with 4 resets at level 62. This took 4 hours and 41 minutes of game time. Of course, I'm doing a second playthrough with this thing, so let's get into that footage now. And while we're getting started, I just want to do a small summary of that playthrough. This sort of feels like the lighter version of Execute, which already felt like the lighter version of Abra. There's an awful early game, and once you clear it, the game gets much more straightforward and easy. So far, it feels like Gloom is like taking all of the worst parts of Oddish, putting them onto a middle stage evolution, making them a little bit worse, and then taking the late game from Vileplume and being like, yeah, Gloom can sort of do that as well, it's just not as good at it. Okay, so I've complained a lot about Gloom, and that is mostly because of how I felt about this playthrough. However, let's put these results in context. So yesterday's middle evolution was Pidgeotto, and after its final playthrough, it got a time of 1 hour 25 minutes and 10 seconds. So Gloom is much better than that. But I don't know if that makes me feel better about it, because this early game is really not fun. In order to get Acid as soon as possible, I'm going to defeat every single trainer, except the ones with Zubat, because those ones are awful until I get Sleep Powder. Okay, so here's some additions on Route 3 that I didn't fight in the last playthrough. This Lass, who has two Pidgeys, I usually avoid her because she has Sand Attack. In this case, it actually gets really annoying. She lowers my accuracy all the way down to negative 6, but I still do manage to win just because I have Poison on my side. I'm also going to fight this Jigglypuff trainer. She has Custom Art after the poor gone race. By the way, if you haven't seen that video, go check it out. I'm really proud of it, but very few people watched it. Because I've done all this training, I'm actually able to learn Sleep Powder very early on into the cave. And you'll also note here that I have left Wild Encounters on in here, specifically because I want the chance to run into Geodudes so I can knock them out for more experience. The amount that they provide is much greater than the Pokemon outside of Mount Moon, so it'll actually be faster for me if I just run into a few in here. I also fight this bug catcher because of how PP works. I have to head back to Nurse Joy, heal up, and then I come back into the cave and I face this rocket who I almost never fight. Beside him is an HP up, which is kind of useful, but overall I just want the experience from his team. The most annoying Pokemon, of course, is Zubat, but I have Sleep Powder to solve it. After that, I pick up the HP up and use it on Gloom. I can continue knocking out Geodudes this entire time, and then I head down the second ladder and face this rocket. Sleep Powder allows me to knock the Zubat bad out, and with it out of the way, the Ekans is much less difficult, and I polish it off. This gives me access to the Aether, which is going to prolong my stay in the cave. I'm able to defeat this hiker essentially for free, and then I'm going to proceed to the next floor, where I can use the Aether to continue against trainers here. I know that I skipped the youngster, and that's specifically because my level is getting high enough that I think I'll be able to level up to 28 on Nugget Bridge. Also, I really didn't want to backtrack, and I just wanted to finish off the cave now as soon as was possible. 
Plus, as soon as I clear it, I can fight a few wild encounters in the patch here just to give me a little bit more experience. After that, in Misty's Gym, I fight the Swimmer for more experience, and this brings Gloom to level 24 before Misty. Of course, she's completely trivial, and this brings Gloom up to level 25. So only three more levels to go. Now, doing all of this leveling actually has some extra advantages. Number one, I outspeed the Spiro on the rivals team. So yeah, this battle is completely trivial now. And now let's check in with where Gloom is at at the end of Nugget Bridge. As I finish off the lass who has the Nidorans on her team, I level up to 28, and here I can learn Acid. This is almost the perfect timing because I only have one more trainer left to defeat, this junior trainer, and now it is time to go up against the Oddish lass. And as we saw before, at level 28, all of her Pokemon are easy one hits with Acid. I can't believe I'm saying this, but all of this planning actually only shaved one minute off the playthrough. Like, uh, this early game is just so bad for Gloom. Anyways, I will take any time savings that I can get. From here on out, I am really not going to change that much between the playthroughs, so we are going to do a major jump forward to the rival in Sylph. Last time I had forgotten Swords Dance for this fight, and this time I did not do that, and as a result I am able to defeat him very easily. After that I take on Koga. Of course the main issue in this fight is what moves is the Venomoth going to choose. It has two chances. First it goes for Leech Life, my acid does massive damage taking it down to red health, and then Koga uses an X attack, so Gloom is proceeding past the 5th gym leader with no resets. And this is where I make my first major change. Remember the rare candies that I didn't use in my previous playthrough? Yeah, I'm going to use all of my rare candies before Blaine because I obviously don't need them later on in the run. This takes Gloom up from level 43 to level 53. And this is going to give me outspeeds on all of Blaine's Pokemon after I set up Sword Stance just twice. In this case I got it on the first use just because I had my defense lowered on the first turn by the Ninetales. Yes, having your stats negatively altered by the opponent's Pokemon does in fact trigger the badge boost. I love Generation 1. Also, because I used rare candies, I am not going to level up mid-battle, so I can just sweep his entire team. Unfortunately, the Arcanine is going to be a two-hit. It strikes back with its most powerful move, Fire Blast. However, that does not do enough damage to knock Gloom out, so I take the victory. No resets so far. However, Sabrina is going to be quite inconsistent, so I'm a little bit worried about this battle. Luckily for me, she just uses X Defend on the first turn, I put her Abra to sleep, and now I can Badge Boost. Again, being a higher level here is going to ensure the outspeed on both the Abra and the Kadabra, and I get a speed tie against the Alakazam. I really considered fighting extra trainers in the mid game to get 134 speed at this point. Also, I did use 5 Carbos again, so I couldn't use an additional vitamin to get one more speed. Still, I figured that Sabrina's AI was inconsistent enough that it made sense to do the battle at this level. Also, I did didn't want to invest additional time into training when she is this inconsistent. After all, in this case I end up taking a first attempt victory. Alright, so it's time for Giovanni, and he's like kind of free, as long as the Doug Trio does not use Fissure on me. It goes for Sand Attack, which is like a nuisance, but fine. I put it to sleep. After that, I finish it off with Acid, finish the Persian off with Acid. Then against the Neoqueen, watch this. It is never going to attack me. It's just going to spam Tail Whip over and over and over again, and I knock it out with Acid. Next, it's Nidoking time. Same thing here. It's just going to spam Leer over and over and over again. And now, all that's left is Rhydon. I use one Mega Drain and finish it off. And as you can see here, leveling up to 53 at Blaine gives me the perfect amount of experience to level up here right after the Rhydon goes down. So I wasn't worried about leveling up mid-fight. And all of that's important because I have to track my experience throughout all of these late game battles so that I know exactly where I am leveling up. Luckily, a software like RBY XP Router shows you this data so I can be very precise about it. In the battle against the rival, I know that I can set up for free on the Sand Slash and then sweep all the way through his Pokemon and get to the Kadabra with my badge boosts intact. That allows me to outspeed, hit it with acid, knocking it out in a single hit, and then I level up. However, Gloom has more than enough speed to still move first against the Flareon, so I can just knock it out with a single acid. Alright, so look at my experience at the end of that battle. It is the exact same at the start of the Lorelei fight. I've mapped things out here so I don't level up before the Jinx. That way, I don't lose my speed boost for it, and it only has a chance to use one move. After all, Mega Drain is not one hitting it. Once it goes down, I level up. I still have enough speed because Lapras is slow, so I finish it off in a single hit. 
Now, I am going to show you the next fight, not because it's difficult, but because of how my experience planning plays into it. By the way, the strategy here is just Mimic Dig set up with Swords Dance and then sweep his entire team. And as you will note, as I am about to knock the Machamp out, I am very close to leveling up. I finish it off, and this gives me just enough experience to pop over to level 59. The reason that that's so important is so that I don't level up in the middle of the Agatha battle, and what this means is that I am going to outspeed all of her Pokémon, and that is a massive consistency boost over the last fight against her. Of course I use the same strategy here, Lick with Swords Dance, and it allows me to take a first attempt victory against her. Okay, so I've made it to Lance. Just before I fight him, I'm going to use the one rare candy that I picked up in Victory Road. I know that I'm almost leveled up, and this is kind of painful to watch, but it is the best choice just so I retain my speed boosts for the entirety of the fight. Okay, so in this battle, I don't want to try and finish him off using just Mega Drain, so I'm going to put the Gyarados to sleep, set up with Swords Dance, and then I am going to mimic Hyper Beam intentionally from his first Pokémon. This way, I can just sweep through the rest of his team members in a series of one hits. The only issue here is that even with badge boosts, I do not outspeed the Aerodactyl. In this case, it goes for Fly right away, hits, getting a critical hit, and this does enough damage to finish Gloom off. Okay, so if the Aerodactyl doesn't hit with a critical hit fly, I'm gonna put it to sleep, and then after that, I can finish it off with like two Mega Drains for accuracy consistency, and after that, I polish the Dragonite off with a Hyper Beam, and now I'm moving on to the Champion. The experience from the Lance fight got me exactly to level 61, so I don't need a rare candy for this fight, things are just planned well enough using the rare candies how I have up until this point in the playthrough. Also I will note here that I tried to get my speed as high as was possible in this playthrough, and like, it ends up being the case that speed tying the Alakazam makes the most sense. In this case I win the tie and knock it out in a single hit, I put the Executor to sleep, finishing it off in two hits, then against Magneton, Earthquake gets the one hit, and with these consistency improvements, I have now arrived at the Cloister with full health. Mega Drain gets a critical hit, just barely not one hitting, it strikes back with Ice Beam, but it does less than half, meaning that even if it crits, it's not going to knock me out. The only loss condition here is getting frozen by the Cloister, or getting hit by the Alakazam earlier on in the fight with something like Kinesis or a crit from Psychic. But that didn't play out today, and so I take a victory over the champion, and Gloom clocks in with a second playthrough time of 1 hour, 9 minutes, and 16 seconds, with one reset at level 62. This took 4 hours and 31 minutes of game time. Alright, so how do these results stack up against the results from Oddish and Vileplume? Well, they're a little bit better than Oddish. It had a real time of 1 hour, 21 minutes, and 46 seconds, and honestly, Gloom's improvement over this is pretty good. However, when we look at Vileplume's results, which were 41 minutes and 36 seconds, it is very clear that this thing has a major glow up when it evolves from Gloom to Vileplume. And uh, that kind of makes sense, like, it starts as this, like, really cute, small radish thing that is not very good, then it evolves into gloom and like, it loses all of its charm and starts drooling, and then it evolves into Vileplume, improving majorly on its aesthetics as well as its ability to beat the game. Okay, so we've completed the evolutionary line in Pokemon Yellow, I think it's time to rank Gloom in my tier list. Its results were 16 seconds faster than Golbat, however they were almost 3 minutes slower than Pidgeot. So today, Gloom earns itself a position near the end of the D tier. Like, subscribe, and ring the chime echo so that you'll be notified when I post new videos. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much, it means the world to me. Now, if you've made it this far, you are incredible, so I have a special little gift for you, which is a battle against Professor Oak. If you didn't already know, Oak has a team defined in the ROM, but you can't actually access it through regular play. You have to use a glitch to access it. For me, I got a ROM programmed that just has three Oaks standing around in Pallet Town, and I can just talk to whichever one I want to battle. By the way, it's very clear that this Oak battle is from Red and Blue, because all of his Pokemon have the moves that they would know at that level. This is how the movesets are assigned in Pokemon Red and Blue, and that's why a lot of Pokemon like Rhydon have some truly strange and terrible movesets. Now for Gloom, basically what I had to solve in this fight was which move do I want to mimic which will pair well with Swords Dance. And honestly, it comes in the form of Stomp from Executor. This move also has a 30% chance to flinch in Generation 1, so that's useful in the case that I don't have enough damage to get the KO. Luckily coming out of the League, I didn't have that much experience, which means I don't level up going into either the Arcanine or the Charizard, and that is just barely the case. 
so I don't reset my speed boost, allowing me to put the Charizard to sleep and then use Stomp to knock it out over two turns. Then my speed is reset, however I'm not sure that that matters because Gyarados is last and it's not going to be able to do significant damage to me with anything other than Hyper Beam. Still, all of this doesn't matter if I put it to sleep and then knock it out over two turns with Stomp. And with that, Gloom has defeated the Secret Oak battle. That's it for this video, I'll see you in my next one.